through the lock. <laughs> Welcome everybody. <laughs> Um, I just want to tell you a bit about the Jewish Historical Society before we start. Uh, our brief, apart from these fireside chats, is to preserve the history of the Jewish community in both Hong Kong and China. And most of the records, as some of you may know, were, <coughs> were lost in World War II, so we start really from after the war, which is very sad, but we don't want this to happen again, so we're making a huge effort to gather as much material as we can from pre-war and after the war, and we have it in, the, in a Judaica library in, in the Jewish Community Center. Um, it's quite an impressive reference library. It's um, open mostly for scholars. Uh, we keep the, the material in the library, but it's, it's available for anybody who wants to look at it, including the disks of these fireside chats. Um, over the years, we've recorded the details of the gravestones in our Jewish cemetery, which is in Happy Valley. No, I won't know what else we've done. <laughs> and, um, and we're in the process of restoring them um, with the help of the trust of um, who are financing it. Um, we've published several monographs and books, which are outside some of them. Um, and these fireside chats are aimed at preserving an oral history of, of the anecdotes and the testimonials of the Jewish community, of those in the Jewish community whose lives have run parallel with Hong Kong's fantastic history. And we want to preserve this Jewish footprint for posterity and build up this oral history for, for uh, the future Jews in our community. So our 15th is Henry Steiner, who is a remarkably gifted graphic designer, um, and Nigel Catt is the interlocutor for this evening, so please welcome Henry Steiner. Um, Henry, thanks for coming along this evening. Um, I've got three quotes that uh, I pulled from you, uh, <coughs> and others have pulled from you, and were published in 1988 and in 2005. Um, in 2005, because you're a, a popular and impressive fellow, you've given a number of interviews, both uh, for educational institutions and for the media, and you told... You, you can tell he's a barrister, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand, but... Um, <laughs> uh, in May 2008, you're quoted as saying, like so many of us, I fear, I'm not very observant, but I'm proud of being a Jew. Mm. Um, in 1988, you gave an interview to a magazine called The Bulletin, and you uh, said two things which, again, I think, one of which will resonate with all of us, and then we can narrow it down to how you perceive yourself, um, because then we can see how and why these two perceptions characterize you and we can take draw those threads from your story in 1988 you said I'm a citizen of the world but I'm also an alien and uh, in at that time also some 12 13 years ago you said I'm a Viennese first but a Jew culturally now these are very unusual apper suits for a man, in, uh, for anybody nowadays to, to come out with. How do you get to be a citizen of the world and a, Vien and a Viennese first, as well as, of course, being a Jew culturally? I'm, I'm trying to um, find a quote I have in here somewhere. Maybe I've lost it. Um, but what I'm looking for, is, is, is this too loud? No. It sounds it's awfully loud to me. No, it's great. Okay. It's fine. So, so you're actually hearing what I'm saying, which is a mistake. <laughs> but, um, but it was, um, I, I thought there was a quote in there from Gustav Mahler who said that uh, he was um, a, a stranger in Austria coming from Bohemia. Um, he was an outsider in Germany being an Austrian, and he was a stranger in the whole world as a Jew. Mm. Um, I think uh, 
it, it's interesting. The Chinese don't understand what a Jew is. They uh, they don't know whether it's it's a an ethnicity, a mm. religion, a nationality. Yeah, and so uh, the House of Lords don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I I don't think I have to defend or, or argue no. with anything that that I've said there. But, but these all do depict how you feel. It, you, you, you just mentioned Marla's family coming from Bohemia. Yours, um, as far as you know, were Spanish and Portuguese Jews. Yeah, yeah, we were uh, Sephardim. And they fled straight to Austria. I say straight, but as far as you know, they went to Austria. Yeah, uh, uh, well, Austria-Hungary. Uh, some of our family were in uh, uh, Budapest uh, and some in Vienna. And uh, I, I took down, uh, after we spoke, uh, I, I gave um, Nigel a deposition uh, about 10 days ago, I think. And Henry's now going to surprise me by yeah. contradicting this. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it's a phenomenon we're familiar with. No, I, I wanted to, um, to, to get some of the family names that, that oh, you yeah. asked me about. Hmm. And um, uh, along with Steiner, of course, there's uh, Deutsch, Weinreb, Schreiber, Grünbaum, and then two that are particularly significant, uh, Zuckerbecker and uh, Hofbauer. Mm. And um, Hofbauer is uh, my mother's uh, maiden name. And he, um, if you mention Hofbauer in, in Austria, he's known as the patron saint of Vienna, uh, a man who was roughly contemporary with Napoleon and Goethe, and uh, bracketed with them, the founder uh, in southern Germany, Bohemia, and Austria of the uh, Redentorist Order, and um, a man who uh, my mother calls the black sheep. <laughs> well, Hofbauer wasn't exactly very Jewish. No, uh, and, and, and I don't know what the connection is. Uh, really, but but Zuckerbeck is interesting because that means, of course, confectioner, mm -hmm. and Hofbauer to this day is a chocolate manufacturer in uh, Austria and I think in uh, in Budapest. Your mum's family, uh, and when you were little, when you were born, you were born in 1934, right, in Vienna, right, and the family when you were very little lived in a place called Baden Bay V. Yes. Um, can you tell us what your father did and what your mother's family had by way of business? My, my father was a, a dentist uh, and uh, my mother, um, uh, she, she, uh, she, she worked, uh, uh, she took in sewing but you know on a sort of a social basis. Mm. We had a, a separate house and um, I, I should uh, give you one quick anecdote which is uh, the, the day I was born, my, my mother took the tram from Baden to Vienna, and uh, it stops outside of the opera house, and she took a taxi to, she was pregnant, uh, she took a taxi to go to um, the hospital, and along the way she heard these explosions, and that day was the day that the Austrian army aimed its cannon at the Karl Marxhof, which was the seat of the, uh, the, the red forces in, in Austria. And uh, it occurred to me it's a bit like Tiananmen, it's, it's fratricide. No. And that sort of sets the tone for the rest of my life. <laughs> but you haven't killed any brothers because you're an only child, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not fratricidal. Yeah. <laughs> they had a reasonably good life in Vienna. Yeah, I've, I've been back there and it's a charming little town. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like a resort. In those years, um, there were quite a lot of Jews there. Your family kept kosher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my was grandmother was there. I, I remember that uh, very well. and. Uh, uh, I, I, I also think anecdotally, uh, I remember one time um, I, I was on my tricycle and I parked it. Uh, I must have been about three or four. Yeah. And um, I, 
I guess four, I, I don't know how well you walk when you're three. But um, I parked it on one side of this big road and walked across it uh, because there was a big sort of affair going on where they were introducing uh, some kind of an Omo product, you know, the, the soap. Yeah. And um, it, it's interesting that I should be drawn by that kind of advertising, you know, at that age. Um, and, you know, that, that marks me. Well, um, what we do know is mm. that you were only two when there was the Anschluss, uh, Austria and Germany formally became one state. I was four. 1930, you're right, 19, what date? The, the Anschluss was in 1936. March 13th, 1938. 1938. I just checked it this morning. I knew I was going to be talking with you. That's good, because I only wrote down the date and I didn't check my facts, so thank you. Um, but, but the family even stayed on for a year or so after the Anschluss. Yeah. That wasn't really deliberate, was it? Because your mum was your mum, who you mentioned before. She really was. She, she she extended herself greatly to save the family. She, she was totally paranoid, uh, mistrusting. Uh, 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 many of the rest of the family were more complacent, and uh, uh, a lot of Austrians were were pan Germanic. You know, meaning they they believed in a in a mm. greater Germany mm. and the um, the priority of uh, of German culture and, and, and so on. I, I know that my uncle, who, who escaped with us, uh, was a big fan of Wagner. Uh, you know, still, and um, uh, she uh, she talked to me, and you know, I, I thought it was just bubbermice about you know on her hands and knees cleaning the sidewalk, but I I realized that this was something that was done after the Crystal Knot, where, so, where they had to scrub the, um, you know, the inscriptions from the uh, the pavements. So she really wasn't paranoid. Things were very dire. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, but, but she seemed to be, she seemed to realize it more than uh, many others in our family who, uh, uh, who didn't make it. Including um, your father made it. Yeah. Because your mum went went to great lengths to make sure that the family went out. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, how she, did she How did she find a way out? Because for Jews trying to get out of Germany proper or Austria proper as late as September 1939 was extremely difficult. No, it wasn't. Uh, she 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 asked uh, somebody with the uh, uh, in in the, uh, the headquarters uh, of the SS, I think. Uh, about getting out, and he said, Madam, uh, we're perfectly happy for you to leave. Uh, we have no uh, objection to you. We just want uh, uh, Austria to be a uh, union. But, yeah, yeah. but she needed some way to get out. She had to. Uh, somewhere. Yeah, uh, you, uh, you could leave, but you had to go somewhere. And that wasn't so. So um, she, she desperately was looking for a. Uh, what was called an affidavit. Uh, you know, in other words, if you wanted to go to America, you had to have a, a guarantor. And and we had this in Hong Kong actually as well. Um, I remember, uh, you know, if I wanted staff, I had to say whatever they did, I, I would uh, I would guarantee them. You know, if they got a to sponsor in America. Yeah, exactly. But she wasn't just looking for her, was she? No, she was looking for her, her husband, me, her brother and her, her mother. I, I think that, that was as many as could make it. And um, she uh, she heard of a, a man who was Austrian but had uh, settled in Hollywood and, and was in the movie business and um, summered in Baden in, in a villa. And, and Baden uh, like any place in Europe that is is Baden or Bad or Bath was found by the Romans because they they could find the sulfur springs you know quickly and uh, so it, it was a great great place for uh, as a resort and he had this villa and she knocked on his door and she said um, uh, I understand that you're an American citizen can you you know really 
do something that will never be a burden on you, but we just need somebody to sign an affidavit for us that we can get out. And um, he said, well, madam, I, I have many requests like that. And she said, if not for me, for my, my son. And she showed him that, that picture that you see over there. You were five. Uh, yeah. And he looked at it and he said, well, I do have many requests like this, but how can I refuse this little Chinese boy? <laughs> <laughs> and he was much more generous than that. He, he enabled your mum to say, you, yeah, the, the, her brother, that part, yeah. her husband, your dad, yeah. and her mother. That's right. Your mum's still with us. She's 104. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. A young 104. Yeah. And where does she live, Henry? Uh, in, a, in a home in, in Queens. Mm -hmm. Because you guys ended up in Brooklyn. That's right. And uh, so you were five. The, la the family spoke German. That's right. And uh, they were both about 40 years of age at that point. Yeah, I, I tried to count on my fingers, but, but that was the, the rough age you, you see. Yeah, yeah. Um, my mother was born in 1906, so, um, so she'd been 30, she'd been 30, 33, yeah. I think. Something like that, yeah. 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 Now, um, and the family lived a little bit later, they moved to Manhattan, but that was yeah. after your father had, um, had split up. Yeah, yeah, my, my mother uh, left my father because um, it, it, was, it was very difficult for him uh, thinking about it. Uh, uh, he, um, he was a dentist. He had uh, got, gotten his qualification in Vienna, which is no mean feat. And coming to America, he would have had to have gone through uh, college and uh, dental school in English and um, I think it was daunting for him and he um, he didn't cope very well. He didn't cope uh, very well and, and my mother left him, yeah. uh, uh, married uh, my stepfather and, and we moved to Manhattan. Mm. His stepfather was Russian Jewish? That's right, yeah, his name was uh, uh, Chabot which uh, is sort of um, not, not anglicized, but uh, uh, Frenchified, uh, because his his name was Shabbos. <laughs> <laughs> and you lived on the Lower East. Side. Gone, yeah. <laughs> and you lived in on the Lower East Side, and um, um, not quite the Lower East Side. But about 18th Street. Yeah, yeah but but it was uh, it was around Stuyvesant yeah, Park. Yeah. Stuyvesant Park and Gramercy Park. And Gramercy. Yeah. Well. And you and you went to Stuyvesant High School and yes. didn't do badly. You eventually, you even with the privations of war, you won a New York State Regent Scholarship. And That's right. by the time uh, 1951, 5051 rolls around, uh, you were in the first co-educational class at Hunter. Hunter College. That's right. So so that I could uh, have the benefit of the uh, the scholarship because if I'd gone outside the state, I would have forfeited that. Now, you were there to study one su one particular subject, weren't you? Well, I, I wasn't sure. When I started, um, I, I was uh, sort of between literature uh, and um, art, and uh, after, after a year or two, I decided that it was easier for me to uh, draw one picture than to uh, write a thousand words. And so I went into painting. Uh, Hunter College at that time was a, a center for the uh, the New York School of Abstract Expressionism, and uh, there were uh, very important uh, painters who, who taught there, like uh, Robert Motherwell, William Bazziotti's <coughs> the sculptor uh, Richard Lippold, yes. and so on. But you didn't turn out to be inclined towards the abstract expressionist Henry. If we look at even now your work, it's it's not abstract and it's no, certainly not no, expressionist. Um, no, um, I, I, I had a hard time with that. Um, 
and um, uh, towards the end of my uh, my, my college um, years, uh, fortunately, uh, the class that I liked very much was uh, uh, printmaking, uh, which was taught by a Hungarian uh, named uh, uh, Peter T. Gabor. And uh, is he Jewish? No, no. Uh, you don't have to be. Jewish to, to be, be Hungarian. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if you were a Hungarian, you were unlikely to survive as a Jew, but in, unless you're in America. So, but he was helpful to you, and it was partly through yeah, him. Yeah, uh, he, he was assigned to me. You know, to, they, they they give you a mentor, and they and, and he, you know, and, and you know, we sat down. and He said, "Well, Henry, t uh, tell me, uh, you know, uh, how do you like painting?" And I said, "Well, I don't think I'm too comfortable with it." too good with color and um, uh, he said well what else do you do and I said well I, 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 I've done a lot of extracurricular things I've, I've been the uh, art editor of the uh, literary magazine of the newspaper of the yearbook uh, I've uh, done set design for plays and, uh, and he said well uh, it sounds to me as though you should um, come to Yale. I also teach at Yale. And uh, why don't you as enroll? As and um, you, can, uh, you can do uh, graphic design. And I said, great. What is it? <laughs> Hang on a minute, Henry. Yeah. Let's just get a little context here. You went up to, you went up to Yale in 55. Yeah. And it wasn't called graphic design. Yes, it was called graphic you design. Told me it I knew it was called commercial art. Ah. Uh, but and, and that's one of the things that you know that that you you're told when you get a, an MBA. Uh, sorry, an MFA is is that you don't call yourself a commercial artist. You call yourself a graphic designer. And, and, I see. You, know, you can charge more. Uh, <laughs> so you got an MFA. Yeah. At Yale, but at Yale again, gifted and brilliant teacher pointed you very strongly? Oh yes, uh, it's a two-year course and the second year um, I, I had known the work of this uh, this designer named uh, Paul Rand who uh, was um, a, a brilliant uh, designer and, and a professional and uh, uh, single-handedly almost created the profession. Um, his uh, uh, Paul Rand, uh, his name was uh, something like um, Pinchas uh, Rosenbaum or something like that. But uh, he, um, he he came to teach the second year I was there. But e even from the first year uh, that I was at Yale, I, I, I knew I'd found myself. Um, I, I was not comfortable with, with painting, but um, Design was like mother's milk to me. Uh, uh, as a, a friend of mine says, uh, you know, he he sat down. He was given an assignment, he had a piece of paper, and uh, he was happy. And um, Rand Rand was. Uh, we laughed at the the adopted name, but yeah. Rand was from right. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So uh, the master totally. of modernism. Yeah. A serious from it. Yeah, and, yeah. And energized what is still your style of design. Would that be fair? Uh, yeah, but it, it, it has nothing to do uh, with his. Uh, I know, I'm not his, saying that one has something to do yeah. with the other, this is the coexistence. In, in, in fact, uh, you know, he said that uh, you know, he, he, he went to shul uh, Fridays and <coughs> Saturdays and he kept the Shabbos and. Uh, and uh, I, I remarked on that, and he said, well, it keeps me humble. And, and I said, uh, well, Paul, uh, you need it more than I do. <laughs> and while you were doing, while you were doing, um, while you were at Yale, yeah. uh, Surrealism, Henry, um, you designed a book. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that, that was to be something that you were going to, you're going to go on to do a lot more later on. But as a first book, as a college book, it was pretty impressive. Yeah, the, the, there was a, um, a, a 
uh, there was a, a teacher there. Um, I, I was introduced to him by, by the head of the, um, the design department. Uh, his name is uh, George Hurd Hamilton, and he edited uh, these um, notes of uh, Marcel Duchamp um, called um, uh, From the Green Box. Mm -hmm. And I, I put the book together, and, and I had the, uh, uh, the fortune of, of uh, meeting Duchamp and, and uh, seeing him a couple of times. And, uh, um, and that, was, that was when you, after Yo, you'd taken a Fulbright as a lucky uh, 50, uh, 1957, yeah, well, right? Yeah, well, uh, when I saw him the second time, I told him that I had this scholarship. And uh, he said, well, you must uh, to Paris. And he said, well, you must uh, meet my friend uh, Man Ray. Uh, so he, he gave me his address. I, I mean, it sounds like I'm bullshitting, but <laughs> it, it's true. It's an astonishing youth. 50, yeah. In 1957, you were 23? Yeah, and, and, and I met Man Ray. And I tell you, he was this, this little yid. <laughs> you know, the, the, I, I forget his real name, but, but it's something is this on? Yeah. yeah. Too much. Yeah. Too much. Um, but uh, you know, he kind of uh, we kind of came to. Uh, I, I went to see him, and you know, we had a little chat, and uh, that was kind of it. Uh, uh, he wasn't impressive, not not like Duchamp, which was you know very seniorial. Mm -hmm. um, after the Sorbonne, you you decided to stay on in France, and you stayed on for about a year, yeah. working for ad, for ad agencies. Yeah, because at that time, uh, the, the French weren't very good at, uh, at graphic design. They, uh, they, they, they have a sort of a painterly tradition which went into their advertising. And, and I remember I visited a, a school um, which taught uh, what, what is really commercial art. Uh, th these people were... Uh, you had these kids who were doing uh, lithography stones where you have to work backwards and upside down uh, creating an image on the stone which is then printed and they were doing uh, giton cigarette packages you know just copying them and um, the uh, the head of the school uh, you know as a matter of courtesy uh, had me in his office and we chatted a bit and he said to me uh, at one point, well, uh, Mr. Steiner, what do you think about this abstract art? Uh, you know, <laughs> in that tone, you know. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez de cet art abstrait? And uh, I said, well, isn't typography abstract? But, but that was the way the French were. But you'd come from advanced modernist America yeah, and yeah. you found uh, to, yourself to, in post-war to, to, to bring light to the Gentiles. Yeah. yeah. Well, I um, not put it that way, but yeah. Um, but uh, the, 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 I, I think what I'm saying here is there wasn't anything to learn. No. Uh, but but the practice was was valuable. Yes, and that um, you, and that's why you went back to New York, where <laughs> we find ourselves in what is presently a hot TV scene. Yeah. Uh, you were a madman. Yes, uh, I, 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 I worked in advertising um, from, uh, well, about 60, 61, yeah. In 1959 to 1960, 61, so spot on Mad Men time, yeah, pretty well. Yeah. What was it like as a period to be in? Uh, it, uh, <sighs> In a, in a, around the time I was in my, my second year at Yale, uh, 57, I think was when, when graphic design really took off. And, and something I should say here is that um, this was a, a Jewish revolution in America. Um, all of the, uh, the big people, uh, Paul Rand was a little bit earlier, he was the tip of the wave. But then you had um, people, uh, Herb Lubalin, uh, Lou Dorfsman, um, people who, um, Lester Beale, 
uh, all Jews and Central and European, Central European and Eastern European Jews who'd fled, gone well, to America, blossomed. Not necessarily. Uh, uh, some of them were second generation, mm -hmm. but I think it was because uh, graphic design was uh, not quite the law or medicine but a little bit better than being a tailor. <laughs> well, certainly, certainly you, you and, and by the way, I think I'm one of the last Jews to, to be in design. I think it's now been taken over by uh, Chinese, uh, you know, uh, everybody. Goyen. We'll come back. <laughs> we'll come back to come back to computers in due course. I mean, I know it's I know it's, a, I know it's an interesting aspect, but. And you didn't stay there very long because somebody offered you a commission, a freelance job, to design a, a magazine in Hong Kong. As we were walking back from the bathroom, he told me about leading a witness. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's doing. And, and I'm tempted to let him talk and leave the room because he's doing a better job than I am. Well, Henry, you did say, compliments. How, how are we not going to... How are we not going to get go on yeah. in one particular yeah. subject? So there yeah. you are. Tell tell us about getting the Asia magazine job that brought you to Hong Kong. <coughs> yeah, well, um, I I had uh, I had worked uh, for about a year before I got the scholarship uh, in advertising and design, and then when I came back, I I went back into that um, and uh, I had been introduced by one of my um, classmates in London uh, who came back to London uh, to, to some names of people in publishing in New York and um, I showed them my portfolio and one of them called me back and said uh, he was with uh, Time International and he said um, uh, I've, I've been offered this uh, position with a magazine called the Asia magazine and uh, we need to um, do some design for them. Uh, are you okay with that? And I said, yeah. And that was the end of it for a while. And then somebody else called me and says, I've taken over for the other guy, and we want to see something now. So I had to get to work. And uh, uh, I became more and more um, sort of permanent freelance with their office in New York. and. Uh, Eventually, they one by one started uh, saying that they were going to come here for the uh, publication date, which was the 1st of October, 1961. And maybe I should come out also because they, they wanted to make sure that everything went smoothly. The Asia Magazine, which some of you uh, will remember, was a uh, color supplement for uh, English language newspapers in the whole region. One English language newspaper per country. And um, it started off with a bang with uh, three quarters of a million circulation from Japan and Korea to Pakistan. Well, it looked that good as well, as we can see. Yeah, you know, there, there's a cover the, there. The original, yeah. that, that's... Uh, that's your, was that your, one that's of your, fine, yeah. and it was a, yeah. uh, the first Asia Magazine cover you did, or? Uh, it, it's an early one. It's an early one. Definitely. And so, so it, it, it went very well. But, yeah. But how did they persuade you to come, Henry? There you were, 20, well, uh, 27 in New York, doing well, not married, life was... Yeah, they, they said, well, well uh, you yeah, know, we're, we're, you know, uh, we're going out to make sure it starts right. Would you like to come? And I didn't know what to say because uh, I, I knew a little bit about uh, Japan from uh, uh, Kurosawa movies, but I, I knew nothing of Hong Kong. And uh, I, I spoke to one of the people I'd worked for. Oh yeah, another name um, uh, among these uh, these uh, pioneering Jews, uh, Chermayev and Geismar. Yes. Um, uh, and I, I spoke to Ivan, and and they are originally Chechen Jews, and they they told you not to come. No, uh, he said. Uh, Ivan said I would work uh, as a uh, as a 
a, a cabin boy uh, on a ship <laughs> if, uh, you know, if, if I had a chance to come to Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, so, so that, that took care of that. And then another, another year, uh, Henry Wolf, who uh, is a fellow Viennese and uh, with whom I, I struck up a, a friendship. Uh, and, and who I adored as a designer. He, uh, he was the uh, art director of Esquire, and then uh, uh, Harper's Bazaar, and then uh, Show Magazine. So Henry Wolfe encouraged you as well, but you know, still there has to be something pretty, pretty good to make you come. I mean, you had well, uh, I, I said, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, Ivan said, you know, of course you should go. So I said, okay, and then I asked Henry. Uh, well, I didn't know, um, you know, how how long should I go for? What should I ask for? And Henry, who who still had his his accent, said, uh, he said "Well, he said, go for uh, uh, nine months and uh, ask for a thousand dollars a month." In nineteen sixty one. Nineteen sixty one. Yeah. And of course, you did. Yeah, because he, he told me. You know? <laughs> I, I, I was empowered by that. You know, I would have never thought of that. It, it was a lot of money at, at that time. And they gave it to you. And yeah, they, they, they didn't know better. They didn't know better. <laughs> so they gave you $1,000 a month at age 27 in 1961 to come and live in Hong Kong on mm -hmm. a nine month thing. And like so many of us, you came for a short period, and 44 years later, um, you're still here. It's a bit more than that. Um, I, um, yeah, well, uh, the, like 14, yeah, 49 years I, I was, um, uh, the, the magazine was, was good for me. I, I got to do uh, uh, a lot of work for them, and including, um, there's something that they call house ads, which are uh, full page advertisements that you stick into the magazine. Uh, to hold a page to say, well, you know, th this is an advertising space, so you don't have to fill it up with a lot of uh, editorial text, which can be expensive. And um, uh, we didn't always have a, a lot of ads, so I got to do these house ads, and, and that was a great experience. I also did uh, some uh, freelance work at that time. I did the, uh, uh, the, the design for the Hong Kong Hilton, which actually began as the um, American Hotel. And um, I did some work for Taiku Sugar. This was all yeah. um, with the permission of the magazine. So let's just, just some people here might like to know what Hong Kong was like and where you lived and how it was in 61. Uh, you li when you arrived, you lived in Chin Sha Chai. Yeah, there, there was a hotel there. Um, the, the International Hotel on uh, Carnivan Road, I think it is, yeah. And um, I was there for a bit, and then I found a flat uh, on uh, Seymour Road. Until you found the flat on Seymour Road, uh, you used to take the Star Ferry across every day? Mm-hmm. Uh, the only way to get across was the Star Ferry and the, uh, the Boat Ferry. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming from Kai Tak and taking the boat ferry, there was something uh, ceremonial, you know, about you know, getting on that boat and getting out of your car and looking at uh, the water line coming up to you. Uh, it, was a, it was a ritual. The vehicle ferry was always the best view. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, there was and a... And it was a, a stately pr procession. Yes. Yeah. Nice way to punctuate the beginning and the end of the day. Yeah. Um, social blossomed at the same time, right? I mean, you worked on this magazine, and pretty quickly you met uh, Lena. Yes. Um, the the, uh, the, uh, the editor and publisher of the Asia magazine were um, Norman Sung, who was a Hawaiian Chinese, and uh, Adrian Zecca, who uh, uh, is uh, uh, an Indonesian, <coughs> and um, uh, Adrian uh, uh, has has great flair. He uh, he went on to uh, do um, the uh, Amman Resort mm -hmm. group, and he uh, he collected a whole 
group of people from, from all over Asia, uh, including um, uh, young female assistants. And, um, one of which you coach. One of which I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he, he stayed away from her because he uh, uh, had to been courting her sister. Ah. <laughs> and she worked in New York too. Yeah, yeah. She she had uh, she had worked. Uh, uh, my, my, uh, she's my ex-wife. Uh, she was born in uh, Tanganyika of a, um, a Sikh family, and then went back to uh, Bombay. And in '64, the pair of you married, and you started your own business as well. That's right. Yeah. And on the back of these uh, independent commissions. Yeah, and, and a retainer from uh, the Asia magazine. Yeah. Right. The business just took off. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think um, people felt that you know design was something that they should know about, and uh, and and, um, and you were ta and you're a talented man, so there wasn't a shortage of people who wanted what you. Yeah, thought. and 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 there weren't too many other people like that. I, I remember once uh, uh, meeting somebody, and uh, we exchanged cards, and. Um, you know, I saw on his card it said uh, um, window displays, um, interior decoration, furniture design, uh, you know, all, all sorts of things like that. And um, when he, he asked me what I did, and I said I did graphic design, I, and he said, what's that? And I said, well, you know, it's uh, designing publications and uh, corporate identity. And he said, what's that? And I said, well, letterheads and so on. And I saw him the next time, uh, a few months later, and uh, he gave me his card, and included with all these other things <laughs> was letterheads. <laughs> Henry, in those three years, 61 to 64, not much contact with the Jewish community. Oh, that there or anything like that. You uh, had a look and didn't appeal. No, I, I, I remember at one point, when we, after we'd been married and moved to uh, Conduit Road, it's funny, uh, that one small area from Seymour to Kandu mm -hmm. to Poshan is where I've, you know, I've spent almost all my time. Uh, but, but I remember uh, going, to, um, going to here one step down. when there, was, uh, w there were tennis courts uh, oh, and yeah. there, there was a, a little clubhouse and, and, and the shul. And um, it, was, it was in the evening, it was dark. And and uh, I knocked on the door, and the door was opened, and I could see a sort of a flickering blue light, which turned out to be a television set in the distance. And um, that was my pacemaker. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I was met by this uh, the, the, this uh, this Chinese gentleman, and he said yes, and I said uh, I'd like to you know come in, and he says. Are you a Jew? <laughs> and you weren't very Viennese. And, and I re-experienced that with the Gurkhas <laughs> this <Yeah>. evening. <laughs> no, no, you were, it, it's my fault. I wasn't here an hour early. Okay. I should have been here early. But um, I was too it, early. It's, um, it, it, it's three years after that. So the business has taken off. 1967 was a bit torrid in Hong Kong. Your office was at the Hilton, right? Yeah, um, we um, uh, the, the Asia magazine uh, during most of the time was. Um, it's okay. It's it's okay. okay. Just don't, don't touch it because otherwise it might bite your finger. <laughs> okay. Uh, was uh, in the uh, Luk Hoi Tung building, uh, which which is demolished now, but it was brand new then, and. Um, then for some reason we had to move to the Hilton temporarily, and um, I stayed on at the Hilton for, um, I forget, two or three years. Next door to the Hilton was, the Hilton's where the Chocom Center is these days. That's right. So next door to the Hilton was a, a low four-story building called Beaconsfield House, right. which is where we've heard in this series there was a volunteer officer's mess on the top where Solly Bard was. That's right. There was the government information services. That's right. 
couple of other things. Across the road, Bank of China and the Hong Kong Bank. Now, in 1967, these institutions and their friends didn't see eye to eye. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the situation was uh, the Bank of China had its loudspeakers uh, aimed uh, across Queen's Road uh, broadcasting um, the numbers and names of policemen who they said they would get when they took over. And uh, the government information service, bless them, put up their own loudspeakers going in the other direction, uh, broadcasting Chinese opera, <laughs> loud. Um, and, and it was the war of the loudspeakers. But the context was the Cultural Revolution was going on 30 miles away across the border. Yes, and, and there were, there were um, Union uh, bus drivers who would park their buses uh, across Con Connaught Road, blocking both ways, and uh, preventing the police from getting at the, uh, at the steering wheel. Um, I, I didn't take many cabs, but I, I'm told that there were some, some cab drivers who didn't pick up Quilo. And and the riots. Uh, and, we're talking and, about and the riots. Quite a few of people, quite a few people got blown up. Yeah, there were riots and bombs in the streets of Hong Kong. Yeah. And um, uh, with, with your indulgence, uh, I, I'll tell this story. I, I went to um, um, I, I went to London, uh, and I, I saw a friend of mine. Um, the, in fact, the guy who introduced me to these people in New York, uh, named Alan Fletcher, who is um, a very important designer. And um, he invited me to his house, um, and uh, we sat down and watched, uh, uh, they were going to have Wimbledon. Mm. And just before that, the BBC had the news. And they said there were uh, there were riots and there was shooting in the new territories, and a policeman had been killed. So I called uh, Hong Kong, and um, nobody answered. It, it would have been about um, eleven thirty here. And, uh, you called the office. No, I called my my, my home. Yeah. It was uh, Saturday. And uh, finally, about. 12.30, I suppose, my, my wife answered, and I said, uh, are you all right? She said, yeah, what, what? And I said, well, it's kind of late. She says, I, I've been out uh, uh, with, you know, whoever it was, uh, some party. And, um, and I said, well, but I was very worried. She says, why? And uh, I said, well, you know, there, there have been all these problems in the new territories, and there was a, a policeman killed, and she said, no, it's not serious. And, and it, and then, as far as the policeman goes, it doesn't matter. He was a Pakistani. <laughs> she, she was a Sikh. <laughs> well, um, and uh, and and then I came back to Hong Kong, uh, and uh, back to the Hilton, where, where there uh, it was a sort of um, a refuge uh, from the you know the demonstrations in the street uh, from time to time, right around the corner from uh, Cotton Tree Drive, uh, where people were trying to get up to get to the government uh, headquarters. And um, in, um, in the fall, uh, November perhaps, uh, somebody came to see me and uh, we had coffee in the, uh, the Hilton um, coffee shop. And uh, uh, this guy, he, he was in London, he said, well, um, when are you leaving Hong Kong? And I said, leaving Hong Kong, who told you that? And he says, you did. And he said, what do you mean? He said, don't you remember in the summer when you told me about the rioting and, and everything and, and you were so, you know, concerned about it? And, and that was the thing, when, when you're there, it seems terrible. When you were here, it, no, you know. Yes, you just get some with it. it. Yeah. We'll come back to that briefly when we get to 97, if I can, because we, okay. need, we need to do a little bit about family, I think. Sure. Um, and then we'll come back and talk about your work in 97 right. and the changes in your life in 97 and 2000.
I, I have an eye on the clock. We're going five to eight. I don't know if anybody minds. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll try fast. <laughs> two boys, born either side of 1967. One in 67. Uh, yeah, uh, six, the correct 66 and 68. Yeah. Called uh, Carl and uh, Kurt. And they both went to school here. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, island school. Uh, obviously not brought up Jewish. I tried, but my heart wasn't in it. <laughs> I, 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 I took them to show one Friday evening, and, and it was you know, kind of depressing. Ah. And um, Carl is now... But back. they were circumcised. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> Carl's now married with a little girl, uh, so you're a grandpa. A granddaughter, yeah. Yeah. And where do they live? Uh, in New Zealand at the moment, yeah. And Kurt? Kurt's uh, in New York uh, working as a uh, uh, an executive placement consultant, uh, or what I used to call a headhunter until he corrected me, mm. um, for a company that specializes in, in design and uh, creative personnel. Do they have, do they feel a strong connection to Hong Kong? Do they, they love Hong Kong, they just don't want to live here. Yes. Does, I know you said you, you and Leela are, are <coughs> divorced, and we'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. But is, is Leela still in Hong Kong? No, she's in New York. Right. So, but, but she she visits. Yeah. yeah. So they can see her. Uh, certainly, Kurt can see her there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so back to the sixties and seventies. That amazingly fruitful period. You picked up the Hong, the Hong Kong bank as a client in nineteen sixty six. Yeah. That's right. And people may not know, but you've done a few good things for them. Well, uh, for 18 years I designed their uh, annual reports, uh, and, and that's something I'm very proud of. And uh, it culminated in doing the, the hexagon for them, their corporate identity, which uh, has uh, stood them in good stead. Well, they spread it worldwide, for sure. Yeah. But in 1975, the thing that always makes me sit up is you had a particular job. 1975, you did, well, tell everybody what you did. The, the, the bank notes? Yeah, the bank notes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I did, uh, I did a 100 and a, and a 500. Um, no, I'm sorry, I think it was a 10 and a, and a 100. Mm. And, and what I did there was I brought, um, but banknotes at that time were sort of churned out out of um, <coughs> out of England. Mm. Um, the, the two companies, uh, Bradbury Wilkinson and uh, uh, Thomas Delarue, mm. and they sort of had uh, generic uh, classical characters. Uh, you know what the uh, uh, what the French call um, firemen. Uh, Pompier, yeah, because of the helmets. Uh, you know, the, these classical figures, you know, with, uh, with, with the, the French firemen's hats, or the women in their robes and, and mm -hmm. trident, and, uh, and they turned it out, it didn't matter if it was Africa or wherever. Mm -hmm. And I introduced the, the bank's own iconography, the lions, uh, the the, the bronze work that they had on the old building the old coating and the old bank. building itself, yeah. yeah. So that it, it, it had something of... So um, you're responsible for our Hong Kong design thing that sticks buildings on the pictures of buildings as badges on everything. Oh no, everybody does that. And, and in fact, I've, I've, I've stopped that with, with the Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, uh, the, 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 there was, um, I think in the early days of the Industrial Revolution when, when companies were starting, they felt, well, look at our building. You know, it didn't matter if they made yeah. uh, uh, toilets or, or, or automobiles, you know, they, they would wanted you to see the building to show they were solid. And um, yeah, I, I did put the building on there, but um, uh, the, 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 there are no buildings anymore on uh, uh, the... Um, the standard chartered bank. You got a bit, uh, you, you did something then. I'm sorry, I'm feeling back a little. 
Uh, you did something then that uh, no, not many people have had the balls to do, Henry. You, you went and did the same thing for the competitor. <laughs> you you designed <laughs> standard charters bank notes. Well, well, the, the, there were only two right. notes issuing banks, right? Uh, three. At that time. Three. Uh, uh, the, the other one was the uh, uh, Mercantile Bank. The Mercantile. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and and that's been replaced now by the Bank of China. Yes. Uh, and, and people, you know, say, isn't that amazing that you have three banks uh, issuing the money uh, and, and none of them are government and uh, uh, you have the same thing in Scotland. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, th three private banks issuing the, the money. But you designed standard chartered banknotes in '78. That's right, and and I've, I've been doing them since. Uh, yes. In fact, you did uh, their 150th commemoration one in 2004, right? right? Correct. Yeah. In 2004, nine. 2009. Yeah. Oh, yes, you're right. 2009. And mm -hmm. including a hundred. He's, he's testing me. I'm just, no, I'm just useless with dates. It's a fa famous failing. I'm it? usually worse. But yeah. not and and a hundred and fifty dollar note. Then. Yeah, that's right. So they're hundred and fifty. And the most brilliant thing about that, as much as I like the design, is that idea of giving it a hundred fifty denomination. It's the only uh, bank note in history with, with that. And, uh, and I still don't know who, who had that idea. I'll find out at some point. Now those those great beginning years, the 70s, early 70s, mm -hmm. you um, were able to indulge yourself a little outside work too. You, you, took, a, you took up scuba diving. Uh, no, I, I, actually, I started that when I was uh, in Europe uh, on the Fulbright. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, I, I was uh, somewhere on, on the Côte d'Azur, and, and, and I saw on the bus there was a, a filling station which also had a sign that said uh, Plonger Sous-Marine. And uh, whatever hotel I was at was near there. And so I, you know, in my bathing suit, I walked over there and, and I said to the guy, I'd like to do scuba diving, and he says, we have him one. And, you know, we virtually walked into the water. Yes. And, and uh, these were the early days of, of Cousteau. And, and, um, and, and, and I went under, and he hadn't told me about uh, uh, regulating the air in your mask. So I, I had to go up because uh, it was starting to pain me because, you know, the, the pressure goes down as the uh, the outside pressure diminishes. Sorry, it goes up. So when I got to the top, he said, "No, you have to breathe into your mask, build it up." But the next morning, I looked like a raccoon. <laughs> so it was all the, the broken capillaries. And in fact, when you came back to Hong Kong, you could scuba dive. At yeah, so interesting. There was scuba diving at Lai Mun. Yeah, the the water was was clear, uh, but. Uh, but it, it looked as though it was in the army. It was all green and brown. It, it wasn't the, you know, the tropical colors you get in the rest of Asia. So scuba diving at the eastern entrance of the harbor. Yeah. And uh, you started to collect things too. Yes, I. I, um, I, I mean, go, going back to Yale, I, um, I, I first uh, learned about uh, Japanese prints and. Uh, you know, it, it, it goes on from Lautrec, who, who was influenced by Japanese prints. And um, when, uh, when I went to uh, Kyoto uh, for uh, Expo 70, uh, there's a, there was a printmaker there who I was introduced to. And he, uh, he said he had some old prints. And um, some of them were by Utamaro. And, and to me, this was something that you know, you only had museums. And I said, you can actually buy them. And uh, anyhow, I, um, you I, bought. I, I realized that, that you can buy them. And, and I've uh, just about never stopped. Because uh, I, I realized that in, in my life, um, 
everything I've done involves uh, paper and printing. Um, you know, and, and Japanese prints fit in there perfectly. And you've got something of a collection now. If you haven't stopped since 1917, you started with Intermaros. Yeah. And um, do you do you ever show them? Have they been out on display? Or? Uh, a, a bit, yeah. I, I, I think it's time I, I do something more about them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I keep them in the bank because um, the best collections were formed by the French, uh, by the, uh, the de Goncourt brothers, who um, were, now the fashionable term is, is early adopters. Mm -hmm. they, they understood uh, Japanese art. They, uh, they wrote about it, uh, and unfortunately, they displayed it. And uh, Japanese prints uh, were like um, fashion magazines. They they weren't meant to be art. They were um, they were transitory things. You stuck them on uh, on on uh, uh, folding uh, screens, uh, uh, and they. Uh, they fade with exposure to ultraviolet light. So it doesn't do them a, a service to, to expose them. So they're mostly, all, a lot of them are kept in the bank. Well, I, I, I do, yeah. Yes. The, you took a house outside Hong Kong as well? Yeah, uh, yeah. My wife, um, unfortunately, uh, was less interested in uh, Hong Kong in terms of real estate than in uh, America, so uh, we got a house in Hawaii yes. and, and we went there uh, you know, for holidays. But it didn't stop you buying an op buying a building or a part of a building in 1981 in Country Road? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we were in the Hilton for a few years and then I was in uh, uh, printing house on um, Dudell and uh, Ice House Streets, and that got torn down um, after only ten years. And uh, I found another uh, office in uh, Aurora House on uh, it was the waterfront at that time, and the landlord uh, got greedy, and I, I finally said. Uh, Never again, uh, and um, decided that I was going to buy an office. And uh, actually, my wife found this uh, this space on uh, Conduit Road. And you've been there ever since. I've been there ever since. Now, see, the only sensible investment I've made. <laughs> well, you know, that's uh, I'm sure there's others, but so be it. The, the Henry, the seventies were fabulous. For the 80s were fabulous for your work. You've been, you worked been on a right, left, and centre. To be, to be frank, you've been made president of the AGI, the Alliance Graphique Internationale. You've made recently, not so long ago, made a fellow of the AIGA, which is the, the International Graphic uh, American Artists. Graphic, the American, American Institute of Graphic Arts. Yes, the Chartered Society of Designers, Hong Kong Designers Association. Member of the New York Art Directors Club, E, a Hong Kong Designer of the Year, a World Master, Japan's Idea Magazine, Ico Grada, which is I, I'm not sure what Ico Grada really is. That they they've named the International you as a Council of um, uh, Graphic Design Associations. That's it. Lots and lots. It's a it's a splendid yeah. acronym, uh, and all these titles are great, and they all really grow out of this huge body of successful work in pretty well starting in the 60s going right through to the 90s. In the 90s we know, you, you've told me and, and people should know that you had a very big and successful office and things are going great guns. 95, you've got a book, you, um, you wrote a book together with Ken House about what is essentially the hallmark of your design, isn't it? The, yeah. Uh, Cross-culture cross -culture design. I, we created that term, which has since uh, taken hold. And, and Ken says uh, we should have copyrighted it, uh, but um, we didn't think of that. 
Uh, and of course, there weren't uh, uh, websites at that time. But, mm -hmm. but, um, but it, that's we see it in everything you do. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I, I think it's. It's a Jewish thing, isn't it? I mean, Jews. Uh, unless you're living in uh, Eretz Israel, but, you know, <laughs> we're cross-cultural. We have to be. We are. We are. If somebody disagrees, enlighten me. Well, I, except I, I do it visually. I just, I just. There's something that that fascinates me now. Here you are. Family have been American citizens since pretty well the the, the 40s, late 40s. 39. Yeah. 39. You were American citizen. You started paying American tax when you worked there and you've done it or did used to do it all the way through mm. brilliant years. Religiously. Yeah, I, 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 yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, and Hong Kong has been was home by 1995-96 Hong Kong was the place of your family, your success, your life. 40, 35 years? 40 years, 35 years of Hong mm. Kong. And then in 1996 the Austrians walk in your door. Ninety-three. I I, I double checked it, uh, Nigel. Uh, Nineteen ninety-three. I had a, a phone call from the Austrian um, <coughs> consul general asking whether he could come to my office. So what do you say? You say uh, you wouldn't let my family stay in your office in nineteen forty-three. Go stuff yourself. It's funny. Now, Nigel has more of a grudge with the Austrians, <laughs> but, um, uh, but but you've probably read more about it. Um, so so he comes by and he says, "Well, uh, we'd like to offer you uh, a citizenship." <coughs> and. Uh, uh, I, I, I asked whether I needed to um, give up my American passport. He said no. And um, I took this uh, as a uh, as an apology, which it was. Did he say so? No, no, he, he didn't. What say made you think it was sorry. an apology? <clears throat> Surely there were well, just well, they do it. it, it, it it's a it's it's a regranting of citizenship. Uh, didn't you have it as a right anyway? No, that, 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 that's one of the grudges I had uh, about the United States. Uh, we, we, we got there in September 1939 by the skin of our teeth. And uh, when we arrived, we were called enemy aliens. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not nice. It's not nice. But they uh, took you in. They, they, they took me in. And, uh, uh, but, but grudgingly. And, and uh, I, I think this is well known. In the whole of the war, not one bomb ever landed on a railroad track leading to the death camps. Um, so uh, I, I wasn't aware of it at the time, of course. But you know, you, you kind of you know, grow up a bit. And I, I think we've, I, I, I've always had this, this fondness for, for Vienna. I, I, in fact, um, our life is so nice that uh, I, 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 for a long time, unconsciously, I had a resentment uh, against my parents for uh, somehow screwing it up. You know, I, I mean, you know, my mother kept me alive, but I, I, I thought, you know, they, they ruined it. You know, it was, was so nice, you know, it was, was, was when you're so five, pleasant. When you're five, you don't know what's going well, on. Well, of course, right? yeah. But um, n nevertheless, I, I learned uh, to speak uh, English in, in America in, in two weeks. And then, like an absolute little prig, uh, refused to speak to my parents in German. Uh, you know, which is now unforgivable, but um, it, it, it's a mark of how important uh, peer pressure is to, to children. You know, mm -hmm. how your peers are, are more important than your parents. So in 93, you're offered the citizenship. Yeah. How long did it take you to accept that? Oh, I, I did it fairly quickly. Uh, I got my passport in uh, 97. 
Um, and um, I had two passports, and, and I decided, well, one is enough. And, and, and I gave up my American one. How long after you got the second one did you give up the American one? I, I, I should have looked that up this morning. And I well, you're going to dump on me on the other day. So but it was, um, some fact. <laughs> I, I, it was I, I think it was something like 98, 99. So about four years, three years after, five years after the offer. Yeah, yeah. Three years afterwards. 97, wasn't that? Was a bit nervous? Uh, yes, the, the run-up was. And... Um, um, when I was in junior high school, I had a, a friend who was named uh, Michael DeAngelis, and he was a, a, red, a red diaper baby. His parents were communist. His father was uh, Italian. His mother was Jewish. And he told me stories about China, how um, when the, uh, we had two things. Well, the big thing we had in common was science fiction, which uh, to me was almost like uh, you know, uh, 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 drug addiction. Yeah. You know, it took me out of the, the real world. <laughs> but um, he, um, he, he told me about how the, the People's Liberation Army, when they would enter a, a, a city and, and, or town and, and free the residents, and the first act that they would do is to get all the landlords and line them up against the wall and shoot them. So after 97, I, I was disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps you weren't alone. But, but 97 was, I, things were a bit nervous. And uh, 98. It, yeah. it, the, the, the problem wasn't at that time, uh, political, it, it was uh, economic. Um, uh, I, I brought out uh, the co-author of the book, uh, Ken Haas, uh, to work with me, and we had big plans. Mm. And virtually, when he arrived in um, uh, July, um, Thailand had its crash, and then the all, all of Asia uh, went south. And then you got sick. Uh, 98. You mean my, my your aortal dissection? My aortal dissection. No, that that was in 99. Oh, oh correct. Uh, September. Yeah. Yes. So 99. You so must have deposition. <laughs> no, 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 no. I just uh, I this just, is why we have these discussions. No, no, no. And, it, and it's on it's on tape. Yes. <laughs> I don't come out of it very well, do I? But, but Better it, than me. It's all about you. Henry and 99 that we had the crash 99 you, you were well, well no no, no 97 97 uh, we had and, the, and, and what I did at that time I, I had this big office but obviously um, things slowed down and, and, and staff started to leave mm. and whereas normally I would replace them I just let them go and uh, that was a good thing uh, it, it, it Reduce the company yeah. and uh, so I'm happy now. Great, and in 1999, you you move right in 2000 or 2001. You'll tell us which you you um, you split up with Lena. Yeah, I actually when, when I was in uh, when I was in the hospital after the operation, I, I decided to do that, and uh, and I never went uh, back to uh, Poshan Road. I, I went to uh, Saing Pun where I am now. And Saeed Bun's a good place to live. I love it, yeah. And Henry, then everybody starts recognizing you with all these awards. 2002, the Icon Grada, 2005, yeah. six. 2006, you became chairman of the Austrian Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, um, and I, I don't know, I've, I've never felt any trace of, um, anti-Semitism mm. from them. That's uh, great. I, I mean, I, I don't think they, um, I don't think they uh, chose me out of political correctness. Mm. No. Uh, I, I, um, I, I, and, and I, 
you know, I, I helped them a lot too. And for that, and I think this is where pretty well we'll come to the end because it brings us right up to date. A lifetime of achievements, so as well as being a cross-cultural alien. They gave you the golden decoration of honor. Yeah, uh, I, I was um, I, I, I was extremely touched by that. Uh, um, and again, it's uh, it, it's a kind of an apology. Um, I, I, needless to say, was uh, uh, thinking about uh, this evening, this morning, and. and uh, uh, I, it seems to me that uh, my life has been uh, one of um, uh, having been shattered and then, you know, gradually picking up pieces and, uh, you know, and, uh, struggling through. Well, Henry, I think everybody here will agree that it's uh, an amazing story, a story of great ups and downs. And great achievements. I don't think anybody here can claim the achievements that you have in, that are so publicly visible in Hong Kong all well, the time. And I'm sure we'd all, everybody wants to join me in saying thanks for coming and telling us about <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I hope we can take some questions if, uh, well, if I've, I've rattled on, but if you want to take a couple, if anybody's got some, Tessa's got one. Tessa? What's your mother think when you offer the citizenship? What did she think? Yeah. I never asked her. <laughs> uh, but I will say that, um, again, this, uh, this genuine graciousness that the Viennese have, um, the, um, the there was a consul general here um, two consuls ago named uh, Brigitte Blaha and um, a, a charming woman who uh, after this went to New York and she offered to um, have a uh, uh, sort of a tea party for my mother on her hundredth hundredth birthday, so it was very nice for her, of course. And she, my mother, got a letter from the uh, mayor of Vienna, you know, so the, the kind of thing they send to uh, people who are hundred years old. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I mean, you know, if you get the mayor of Vienna, why bother with the queen? But. Um, <laughs> I, I think she was quite happy about it, and, and she told me once about having gone back to Vienna uh, after the war, and um, you know the sense of you know being able to walk around and um, you know feel free. Mm. Um, I, I went to Vienna when I was on my Fulbright, and uh, um, and saw some family who had come back uh, from Israel, and I remember. Uh, there were bullet holes all over the place, bullet holes on the facade of the opera, and um, at that time you could still feel the, what would that be, 15 years after the war, the uh, it was still, still yeah, like, it was, it was 1960. Um, anybody else? I wanted to ask a question. Yes. Um, what do you think about the new Hong Kong logo? Oh, I was going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, you, this, is, this, is a, this is a very uh, private group. You can say what you like. Except it's on record. Does anybody seriously need to know what my opinion is? I mean, it, it, it speaks for itself. Um, it's humiliating. Uh, and, 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 and I love the way that um, uh, the uh, financial secretary refers to it as uh, being a, a refreshed logo. Um, he paid for it. We paid for it. He signed it up. It, it, it's, uh, the government is very busy um, devoting its time to showing that they're doing something without actually accomplishing anything. 
and, and logos are a wonderful way to do that. You know, you see you know, the logo, show it around, we, we have an initiative, we uh, you know, get opinions and, and so on. And you end up with what? You know, uh, it, it's like they say a camel is a racehorse designed by a committee. Well, this is a dragon designed by a committee. <laughs> and, and you have the, the three ribbons and... Um, is that what they are? Uh, yes, and, and as I pointed out, uh, in 1998, the IFC Mall came out with its, its logo with, with three ribbons in, in the same colors. So, um, you see, is this a Chinese Alice in Wonderland here? Uh, what's going on? So, um, I think he doesn't like it. Does <laughs> anybody else? It's got not that I don't like it, but. It doesn't do the job. Um, uh, one of the, well, excuse me for this, but one of the biggest problems that um, uh, design has today is the confusion between function and decoration. And uh, somewhere people get the idea that <coughs> design is you know, pretty things, you know, uh, putting up nice colors and, you know, doing interesting novel things. They love this word innovation, you know. Well, it's not innovation. It's either invention or it's decoration, fashion. And um, this is something that doesn't function. Uh, the function of graphic design is communication. And it doesn't communicate anything. Um, what they should have done is, is put the word uh, third between Asia's and world. Uh, that, would have been, that would have been refreshing. Uh, but, but, and so what this logo represents is doing nothing uh, and sort of, you know, getting away with it, just, just having a decoration, you know, some, something that, that From the man who studied with the abstract expressionists, who took modernism yeah. and straightened pure communication to it, visual communication to its heights, you couldn't ask for a more clear exposition. Henry Steiner.